Holy Spirit again. Today marks the third day of September already. As we lurch forward toward the fall and winter months, clinging to what is left of summer, we are acutely aware of the season of diligent, dutiful work that lies ahead of us. Uh, and, and we celebrate what is called Labor Day weekend, that we get to sap out every last bit of, of what is left of our summer. So today, I urge you and I unction you, enjoy time by the poolside one last time, or perhaps go for a bike ride. I implore you, whatever it is, squeeze every last drop of summer and relaxation before the air gets cooler and you find yourself spending your Sunday afternoons and evenings raking leaves and waterproofing your boats. Last year, I spoke on Labor Day weekend on the theme of the great work that each of us has been given. We unpacked the value of, of not dreading the work uh, to be done ahead of us, but rather that we should embrace and celebrate that God has given us a glorious work, each and every one. That stored up in our very being is the blessing that God has made us for good works. And that we should be humbled and overjoyed that God, the God of all creation, would consider us worthy to his plans and to his purposes. But I know for myself, I spent much of the past summer months even busier than I often find myself during the supposedly busy season following Labor Day. In fact, even now, our very own Pastor Dave is away on vacation, finally resting and recuperating after one of the busiest seasons that we have seen at our church in a long time with uh, worship in the wild being an incredible sex success beyond uh, what I could have possibly imagined. And what marker for success do we see? What warrants the busyness? What warrants all, all of the effort that we put in? How can we gauge all of that effort and whether it was worth being put in? Even within the first 15 minutes of a 12-hour day that I spent at, at Worship in the Wild in that prayer tent alongside my brother Clarence, he came to me within the first 15 minutes of the day and he said, I just prayed with that young lady over there and she has given her life to the Lord. In the first 15 minutes of a 12-hour day and immediately my response was it was all worth it every painstaking moment every hour of prayer every effort made worth the everything made worthwhile in the moment you remember the marker for success according to god's will to be to see people saved every effort in this life it is all worth it when we recognize there is a name written in the book of life along with ours. And let me tell you, this event was wildly successful beyond my imagination because we saw many, many more than just this one young lady saved. And as I raised my hands in worship next to the crowd of witnesses alongside me, I knew God was glorified in our midst that day. As the walls of denomination were torn down, we came together before Christ as a body unified by one spirit and one Lord according to Ephesians 4.4. I'm glad to know that I am part of this generation, that we will witness the Spirit of God falling upon all mankind, all flesh, the manservants, the maidservants. And we know that God is doing a new thing. He is ushering in a time of harvest where as bountiful as the harvest will be of those who will come to know Christ, the work will also be plenty. And while the laborers will be few, we will need to be diligent as we stand here on this Labor Day weekend, looking ahead at the work to be accomplished. And yet you may find yourself in a place similar to that which I confessed. As you stand here on Labor Day weekend and you acknowledge this season of work that lies ahead of you and reflect on this, this summer season behind you, which was meant to be of rest, you recognize you have not rested as much as you intended this summer. Or maybe like me, recognizing the workload of the summer is just as busy as any other season in your life, it's just that it comes with sporadic weekend trips or, or getaways where you retire, return back more tired than when you left. Does anyone here know what I'm talking about? By a show of hands, who, who here does what I do when they go on vacation where they think, you know, I, I, I don't want to waste my summer days. I don't want to spend the day morning until night uh, resting and relaxing. I want to do all of the fun activities to enjoy this summer weather. Maybe riding the jet ski at the beach as the sun saps every last bit of life out of you. 
and truly enjoy every moment of it, but when you return home, the only thing you have left are the memories of when you wiped out on that jet ski, and now the byproducts of this vacation are a bum shoulder and a wicked sunburn. You see, we in North America have fallen victim to this culture our society has cultivated of being hyperactive. That, the, that we work hard and we play hard, and we leave little time for rest. And we pause here this morning reflecting on any work in our lives that has been recently accomplished, both in the world and in the kingdom. It is easy to focus on the lack of rest we have experienced as we stare forward at a season of a lot more work. And it is easy for us to do so, as we do so, to fall into the pitfall of weariness. Now you may be hearing everything I have just said about my experience this past summer and agreeing with every word. Maybe you are like me and you have a chronic need to say yes to everything, whether it be tasks at work or or late nights with your friends, staying up every last hour and trying to enjoy every moment and you leave yourself very thin. Or maybe you're hearing what I have just said and, and think, well, no, Joel, actually, unlike you, I'm, I'm retired. When I vacation, I, I make sure that I enjoy my time of leisure and actually, I'm pretty well rested these days. I promise you, from whatever side of the spectrum you find yourself on, from exhausted like me or, or well rested, this message that I've put together this morning, it is for each and every one. And it is one that has been entitled, Putting Weariness to Rest pun very much intended. You see, this biblical theme of weariness is different in some ways from the fatigue one experiences in this world. In a much more literal sense, this word of weariness in scripture, and I'm going to try my best to pronounce this, ikakeo, to be utterly spiritless. That word for weariness, ikakeo, means to be utterly spiritless. It can be defined in, in scripture by this form of a spiritual reluctance, which can stem from fatigue. But as many of those in the audience and, and congregation understand, spiritual weariness is also called in our generation by the name spiritual burnout. This matter of fatigue is not so much a condition that afflicts the body, but the mind and spirit of the believer to the point where their very spirit is demoralized and cannot go on in doing the good works that God has called them to. I would like to have the congregation turn with me to our central passage for the word this morning out of Galatians 6, 3 to 10. And for those who do not have your Bibles with you, uh, it will be shown on the screen behind me. Let us read together. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap of the flesh corruption, but he who sows of the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Amen. Now, I must confess this passage when I first read it on this theme of the weariness that I was beginning to feel in my spirit looking ahead as I recognized very late into the weekend that apparently this is a Labor Day weekend, a time to rest and to look forward to the work at hand. And and, and I was actually a lot less encouraged in many places and actually a lot more confused at this cursory glance. Let me explain. By examining The passage, Paul writes to the people of Galatia, who are in a somewhat similar place to us, we recognize that this is a place seeing before them a great work to be accomplished in the moving of the Holy Spirit, and yet recognizing their insufficiency, the insufficiency that we too have in our own strength and motivation to said task. 
you see the difference between our context and theirs lies in how we interpret what Paul has just asked of us. You see, the Galatian Christians are being written to in order that they would be convinced once again that trusting in their flesh in this life will only lead to corruption. Similarly, we recognize that our reliance on our own power only leads to decay and to death, especially when it comes to our calling in the good work of the kingdom that lies ahead of us. That is true whether we trust human effort to save us by following the rituals and sacraments of the laws that Galatian did, or in our own sinful, selfish, prideful desire to do everything in our own strength, or to burn out and not do it at all. It is as though we feel there are only those two options. That we must do it ourselves, we must be prideful and press on. And then when we get weary and we get exhausted, we say, well, it's either my way or the highway. And so I'm not going to do it whatsoever. As we know, salvation comes only by planting the Spirit, is what Paul is writing to the people of Galatia. Through faith in Christ for the forgiveness of our sin, God gives us his own spirit. Only that spirit will deliver both eternal life and the ability and power we have to attain to it or to lead another to it. As we have just read in Galatians 6, 6 to 8, we sow our efforts of our faith or our lives into whatever it is that we sow into, we will reap. And if we sow into our own sufficiency, we will reap failure every single time. Now we see at the end of this section, Paul urges these Galatians not to grow tired or weary in doing good. Do not be deceived. Doing good work can be hard work depending upon how you approach it. And even more so when someone begins to doubt whether it matters. For we see in verse 9 that Paul implores us to not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. It is only if we do not lose heart. It is only if we stop telling ourselves, is it worth it at all to continue on? Paul is urging these Galatians to keep living in a way that is consistent with what they believe and what they know to be true. You can know it in your mind and yet not feel it in your spirit. They are free people in Christ, and God's Spirit is with them. Eventually, this crop of eternal life will come up if they see it for themselves. In a much more immediate sense, the good works that the Galatians are doing in the Spirit are beginning to bear fruit. But this letter is attempting to combat all their insufficiencies and attempting to accomplish these good works while going to so many empty sources. While going to other truths, hating the word of of the gospel. We know that the only source which revitalizes and restores us and prepares us and enables us to do this good work is the spirit of the living God. God will often allow his people to see how their investment of themselves to do good matters both in this life and in the life to come. But it requires us to stave off this spiritual burnout of weariness that we will not bring down, that that will not just bring down you in your faith for a time, but it will keep you down. If you allow this spiritual burnout to creep into your life, it will not take you down for a time, for a season. It will keep you down in cynical skepticism that you can't even muster it inside of yourself anymore to do what you know you are called to do because doing good is indeed hard. So how can we resolve this misunderstanding that doing good can be hard and also leave you feeling dull and lifeless and at times discouraged and outright defeated? How can we rectify this? How can we resolve this when we know that Jesus promised his yoke would be easy? How can it be so hard when Jesus said it would be easy? How do we rectify this juxtaposition that Jesus said his yoke would be easy when we feel so exhausted at the thought of pressing on? How do we take this weariness and this burnout and remedy it with spiritual ointment? When we recognize that scripture that I've just read in Matthew 11, 
Jesus calls us to take upon, him, uh, take upon us his yoke. And for those who do not know what a yoke is, it is not an egg yoke. That would, it was rather instead in their time something that would be pulled by oxen and workhorses. And it would rest upon their shoulders and their back. And they would pull, wear these heavy harnesses to pull even heavier farming equipment. And where in this passage Jesus tells us his yoke would be easy, he is in fact not saying at all that the burden of doing good is to be light, but it is rather very heavy. So incredibly heavy, in fact, that trying to bear it alone, you will quickly become weary, you will quickly become overburdened, and you will recognize your insufficiency to move forward. Not needing just a short rest, but being crippled under the weight of considering moving forward. It reminds me of this incredible truth I heard at a Man Up event last year. One of our Christian brothers was speaking upon how he fell into the pitfalls of vocational ministry. And much more, he said he fell into the pitfalls of being recognized within his vocation. That when people saw him doing what was right in the the sight of the Lord, he felt as though he could never slip up. Feelings I have had myself as a young pastor in ministry That upon those in ministry, there is a higher standard to uphold, that you are focal, people are watching you, and for a time, you can do everything right, but eventually, it will wear you down, it will break you and your ministry, and you will recognize it was never about your own perfection. The verse he used to illustrate this feeling in his own life was Romans 7, 24 to 25. One that is common not just to him, but to all mankind, where it is written, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is how weariness feels. Like a body of death. Dread overcomes you as you consider doing good, but the word he highlighted when he spoke on this passage was wretched. Naturally, I thought in this context, the writer of the verse was using the same definition that our brother thought of when he had first read this verse. We believed that the writer was describing his body as wretched, as in despicable, contemptible, wholly unworthy and unredeemable, how wicked and evil we are. We are wretched, but we believed this wrongly. For anyone who knows what the actual definition of wretched means, including in this context of this passage in Romans 7, 24 to 25, this word wretched is used to describe something that is worn out. That has been completely exhausted in its usefulness in doing good under its own capability. It can go on no longer. That when a broom has been used and used and used, its bristles wear out and its handle becomes splintered, that broom is wretched from being overused. And in the same way, we begin to feel that, in that this, we recognize this body of death, this wretchedness has come from trying so hard for so long to be sufficient ourselves. And when the author writes, who will deliver me from this body of death? He isn't making a request that is so unbelievable and so implausible that being saved from this wretchedness is impossible. He proceeds to thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is doing it. He is thanking Christ for the work that he is doing through him to restore his body from death to one of new life. Thank you. Jesus, thank you, Lord, you are the only one who can redeem me from this wretchedness. You are the only one who can take this exhaustion and this being beaten down in this world and restore me to new life. Praise you, God. You see this passage in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, when Christ tells us of an easy yoke. He is not standing aside and ridiculing us for having such a hard time bearing our load, as Paul says, but is doing what Paul told us to do, to help carry one another's burdens. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me as I walk alongside you and show you how to do this, how to walk this life, how to carry your load. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He is offering to help 
to carry that which is overbearing you. That you in your own strength, you are becoming wretched. Your body is like one of death. And he is saying, I'll carry the weight. Walk alongside me and I will carry the weight and I will do the work if you just let me show you and teach you a better way. And before he begins this offer to partner, of a partner to carry that yoke with you to help lighten your load, he first calls to him all that are weary all who are wretched and battered and burnt out, and to those who are reluctant at even the thought of returning to a calling you once had upon your life. And he says, and he makes you a promise that to all who are weary and heavy laden, he will give you rest. Jesus, in the context behind this passage of a miraculous seeming promise, has already made an extraordinary claim. Now he makes an extraordinary offer to all who hear him. You see, he claimed in the previous verses, Matthew eleven twenty five to 27, to be the only one who knows God the Father and to be able to reveal the Father to anyone he chooses. And he now makes you an invitation if you are struggling, if you are tired, if you are weary, if you are beaten down, if you feel wretched in this body of death, I can give you relief. Here is the implication. Jesus' Jewish listeners were engaged in this mighty struggle to know God the Father. Their religious leaders had placed enormous weights and burdens upon them, and they were laboring to carry these, these burdens in hopes of being approved by God. And Jesus has just said that he can reveal his Father to anyone, and he immediately offers rest to those that have been weighed down doing it the wrong way. So then what does this look like? How can I apply that spiritual ointment, this cooling salve to my burnout? How can I put this weariness I have been caught up in so, for so long to rest? How can Christ return me a heart and a will to do good after all this time? And much more than this, how can God replace this dread that I have within me at the thought of laboring for him? How can he replace that dread with the passion to be reignited, that first flame I experienced when I had first come to Christ and I experienced that first love. I know for some this weariness may be new to you, that some of you may be in that first love still, but a day will come when you experience this weariness in doing good, that the thought of rolling out of bed in the morning to go and be a light in the world and the workplace sounds challenging. And for many of you listening this morning, you are recognizing this is me. These experiences, they are mine. The promise Christ makes starts with an invitation. To all who are weary and heavy laden, Christ first says, come. Come to me. There could be very many different reasons for which you are weary. Weary of the sin that you are caught up in. Weary and tired by the burdens of this world. Weary and tired of trying to be good enough to be accepted by God. For a Jew, it would have been wearisome to try to follow the countless rules which had been added to the scriptures over the years and know you are never even close to good enough to reach that standard. Now the weary are the people who are trying their hardest to make it in this life but are not achieving what they hope for. Seeing people saved and, and clinging to those moments where you don't just plant a seed, but, but every once in a while you get to experience the harvest and yet the goal seems continually out of reach. That no matter how long you keep at it, the work remains ahead of you and an empty heart and dissatisfaction are ever present. Focus your eyes not on the waves but on Christ. The invitation that he makes, come, it is available. It requires an action. Come, step out from your com comfort, from the boat that you have been hiding in, avoiding eye contact with Jesus, inviting you to return to him and help you back on that path to doing good. The invitation, it is available. Or for those who have been doing good but are growing tired and are unsure how they will possibly continue on. And the temptation is mounting to give up and to recoil back away from doing good. And to avoiding the work ahead of you. 
before that spiritual burnout takes hold of your life, the invitation, it is available. The promise, I will give you rest. It is the same type of promise Jesus made when he said he is the bread of life and also the living water. It is the same promise he made when he said, I am the blood and I am the body. Jesus promises rest. He promises restoration. Not physical rest. He himself rested physically very little. In fact, he was napping in a boat when there were storms and he was woken up from it to do more work. But a rest from toiling on our own to achieve the unachievable, he gives us what we are longing for. He fills our hearts with joy and with gladness and with satisfaction, an ability to be brought high and to be brought low, and he gives it as a free gift, which we do not earn and we do not deserve. His yoke He still expects us to learn from him and to follow in his ways, and yet his yoke, he promises, is not heavy when you don't carry it yourself. For just as a command is not burdensome if you want to obey it, a calling is not burdensome if you love the one who gave it, and you love the one who walks alongside you carrying that yoke. He is not a harsh master. He is loving And though he is our master, he is also our friend. For I am gentle and humble in heart, says Jesus. When the people mocked him on the cross, he did not open his mouth to rebuke him or to rebuke them. Neither did he call fire from heaven to consume them. But he prayed a prayer that they would be forgiven. He is a gentle, merciful, loving savior. Now we should understand that Jesus is also firm and tough when he needs to be, such as when Peter attempted him not to go to that very cross with his mission to die on the cross. He rebuked him, get thee behind me, Satan. Harsh. But we know he can be gentle as well, like when he asked Peter three times, do you love me? He asked this instead of chastising Peter for his three times but denial. He knew that he would deny him three times, and so he first wanted to hear, do you love me? To know what was true. If you are weary in this world, you need look no further than the eyes of Jesus. Stop looking down at the wooden boards of you, that you have built out of what is comfortable and what is convenient. Listen to Jesus as he calls you forward. Don't focus on the work at hand. Don't focus on the waves. Keep your eyes trained on Jesus who said, I will carry the weight. I will keep you from all harm. If you are trying to be good enough to be accepted by him or by others, you need to come to Jesus. If you are stressed and your thoughts are in turmoil, then you need to come to Jesus. He is a shepherd who leads us to the green grass and quiet waters. He restores our soul by restoring us to right view and right relationship with the Father as our only advocate. He who teaches us the truth and value of Sabbath, it is not an arbitrary law which must be upheld only on Sundays to ensure that that we are not doing work, but it is about honoring God and our own bodies in understanding that even God rested on the seventh day of creation. For us to not rest, to not take this Sabbath every week, is to say to God, I am greater than you. For I, who am man, don't even need to rest every week. But we are not God. Our God rested. We are not above the God of all creation. We are susceptible to weariness and burnout where he is not. So he put in place this thing of rest and Sabbath to care for our bodies and to go to him when we are weary and to recognize the need just to be still before God and let him restore our soul. We must go to Jesus in prayer, in active relationship, in confession, and as Christ says, in the renewing of our minds according to, according to Romans 12, 2. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And we have a pattern in this world, don't we? Of hyperactivity, of being constantly on the go, never allowing ourselves a moment to rest and to be restored. The world is too busy for us to listen to Christ these days, to stop and, and be silent before him. Do not conform to that pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. That in seeking to restore our view to Christ, to renew our perspective in these patterns of thought that have been built up, to assess yourself and confess where your heart has been. Come to him earnestly seeking to be renewed and he is faithful and just to forgive and to restore not just your relationship and your view of him. He is worthy to restore his good works in and through you. But God promises to restore us also to our first love. Oh, how we long to be restored to that first love I'm sure each in this room can think of that first moment that they were saved. And if you have not been saved, I urge you, be saved. The Lord, he is good. That first love to be on fire for Christ. Every desire in your heart for him and to be used by him before that spiritual burnout scathed you. Is it possible to return then? to being unscathed, to being passionately in love with God and his purposes. Christ promises us this in Revelation 2, 4, 5. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. And what is the remedy? Repent. Repent of that condition in your heart. The thing that has kept you in this place of saying, I cannot go on, I cannot do it, God, I, I revile your ways. They are exhausting me. Repent of the condition of your heart that when you consider the work ahead of you, you recoil instead of pressing forward. Be restored to this first love, to that first fire, to that passion, to, to a place where every desire in your heart is for Christ and perform the deeds you did at first. But if you do not repent, he warns you, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Just as with any good relationship, rather than being incapable of admitting fault, we must not be incapable of admitting our sin, acknowledging the place of our heart, recognizing that weariness isn't tiredness. It is a built-up condition of the heart and mind to stop revering God and his ways to begin reviling them because we are incapable in our own strength of following them. We must come frankly to Christ, confessing our insufficiency. Addressing that weariness can be a temporary feeling, but you cannot allow it to become the condition of your heart. Rather, God's desire is as yours is, to restore relationship, your relationship with him personally, to rebuild healthy pathways to love God and to be loved by God, teaching you a better way as you carry that yoke alongside him. And knowing this commission given to you is a commission. I'm gonna call the worship team at this time. That you can begin to honor him once again in doing that which he would call you to do, but being prepared to acknowledge your own limitation, to know your boundary, calling upon the Holy Spirit to be your comforter and advocate to build you up for that which is too difficult to do in your own strength, and to learn again how to delight in that which is challenging, to not look at the mountain as an insurmountable thing of work, but as an opportunity to experience how God can bring you through every trial and every season, every tribulation, And that scaling that mountain that when you reach the top, you will say, thank you, Lord, for the strength to do so and the the, the blessing that it is to see down from where you see, to see as your heart is above us. I'll close with this, that serving God should never be obligatory. It should never be self-destructive. 
If you notice the pattern of weariness reshaping your life, recognize your need to step back from your own efforts and to give in to God for all that you require. I'm going to pray a prayer for all those who are in our midst and all those who who are watching online. Join in with me in this prayer uh, as we transition first to a time of worship and then to communion. A time of reflection in which we get to consecrate our hearts to Christ and that we would do so from a place no longer of weariness but of joy and delight that we are in the process of being restored as we look at this body of death we say who will restore me it is not impossible he is doing it even now in your heart and in your mind call out to him and say Lord I need you come I need you let us pray Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who restores us, that you lead us beside still water. Lord, that you, you lead us through, through the valley of death and you bring us out on the other side. And yet, Lord, we are unscathed by the, 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 the burnout. We are unscathed by the weariness, by the destruction that, that the enemy would seek to bring in our life, the division he attempts to, to bring that would keep us from going to your good ways. Lord, we pray this prayer of reconciliation. Lord, restore us for the work that is ahead. But even more so, Lord, restore us that we may see you as you truly are, a loving and merciful God who does the work of restoration in and through us. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Hey, Lighthouse family, thank you so much for tuning in to another one of our services. We have a couple more sermons highlighted for you on the annotations here and here, so click if you're interested, or tune into one of our live streams at lighthouseniagara.com at 10 o'clock every single week. Have a great day. God bless.